But I do so enjoy our little chats. Some may call it spitting, belching and passing wind, but to me, your every utterance is simply music to the ears. G'day audio files. this is the Sirens of Audio. Welcome back to another instalment. My name is Dwayne and joining me as always is my good friend Philip. G'day. G'day Dwayne, hello everyone, good to have you here again. And uh, Philip, we've, we're not alone this time. Uh, we're not bantering away at each other. Um, but because of your special relationship with our guest today, I'll, I'll get you to do the honours and introduce him. Okay then, yeah, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a relationship there because he's actually uh, my cousin, uh, but more than that, he's uh, another big Doctor Who fan, another big lo- lover of Big Finish, and he also has another connection with Doctor Who as well, which will be interesting to talk about as well. So, Chris, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. And yeah, obviously, I can do a catch up with my cousin and talk about Doctor Who at the same time. So this is kind of a win-win for me. What could be better? <laughs> so we're best in the world. So I'm in Sydney, Dwayne's still in Darwin. Where best in the world are you, Chris? I'm in London, so this is where I've been living for the last 13 years now, uh, originally from Sydney, but yeah, 13 years I've been in, in London now, which has been great. Yeah, what, so what's the connection to Doctor Who? Why, 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 are you, why are you interested in how did you get involved? I, I'm sure you would love to hear this for, for various reasons, uh, one of which is I have to mention you. Uh, Purely n- not as the, the root cause, but uh, I do remember as a kid and obviously being just a little bit younger than you uh, growing up, I was aware of the fact that you were into Doctor Who. Uh, if anything, that might have made me go, I'm not going to be into that. But fortunately, <laughs> you know, we on the ABC, we had Doctor Who showing pretty much every night of the week, you know, weeknights at least. And, and like any kid sort of growing up in the late 70s, early 80s, I just started watching it naturally you know it appealed to me and uh i i got hooked in so i think it it happened sort of separately to you and i don't even think we really had the chance to bond over it as kids as such but yeah it 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 happened as it did to many people of our generation and um i i was hooked in and so really it began with tom but for me i think when peter you know, became the doctor, that was when I really locked in and I was both the right age and inclination that, that he was the doctor for me and, and I was hooked. Yep. Now, um, you have another connection now with work. What, 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 what are you doing in England? What have you been doing the last couple of years? What are you doing now? And what's the connection with Doctor Who and other yep. fandoms there? So my connection with Doctor Who for work has basically been in my last two jobs kind of you could say three I guess so you know over the last few years I used to be the events manager in a comic shop here in London called Orbital Comics and we actually hosted a bunch of really good Doctor Who events in the store um, obviously because that was something I was into but my work there led me to being picked up a few years ago let me see 2016 by Titan Comics so I became the brand manager for them And so a big part of that was looking after the Doctor Who line and basically being sort of a bit of a a pimp for that, for want of a better word. So I got to do some really cool stuff with that, uh, including probably what I'm most proud of, which is uh, when we launched the 13th Doctor, I was able to commission all the covers for that. So it was a case of bringing in all the artists I wanted to use. Um, And my work there brought me to the attention of Eagle Moss and they asked me to come across to be 
brand manager for Hero Collector, which is their line of everything sort of pop culture. And they have a huge selection of Doctor Who stuff. So I think traditionally people are aware of the Doctor Who figurine collection, which is up to, I think it's close to 180 issues now at this stage uh, and is going to continue through to 200. But we've launched, you know, various spin-offs since then. So there's Doctor Who companion sets, Time Lord sets, uh, with part of Time Lord Victorious, which is coming up. So, yeah, Doctor Who has very much become a big part of my working life as well as my fan life. And I'm really fortunate to work in something that I enjoy so much. It's great when you take your hobby and it becomes your work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is great. It, it does take away from the hobby a little bit sometimes. But uh, weirdly, it's, it's not affected my love of Doctor Who too much. I know for comics, you know, that sort of took a hit for a number of years and I had to re-establish my relationship with that. But even with Doctor Who, you know, I will spend most nights sort of winding down at the end of the night before I go to bed watching one of my DVDs or Blu-rays still and still getting the same pleasure out of that, which I'm really grateful for because, yeah, there are certain things where if your job bleeds over it can ruin it, but that hasn't happened with the Doctor. So what are your three or four go-to Doctor Who stories? Oh, to, like, just to watch if I go and yeah. put them on? Um, so, yeah, weirdly enough, I've mentioned it before because I almost used this background or that background instead, but um, Mask of Mandragora is, is one. I, it's not necessarily a great one, but it just holds, uh, I, I don't know, nostalgic value for me and it's in Port Marion which I love you, you know and there's the prisoner connection there so there's that uh, I would have to say Castro Valva uh, just introducing us to the fifth doctor uh, I, I still love going back to that uh, earth shock uh, and and I was one of the people that was sad about Adric dying so you know, <laughs> perhaps the minority there but yeah it's true um, and I, I guess I'm giving myself away as being such a, a Fifth Doctor fan, but Caves of Androzani, I think those those four are kind of my immediate go-tos. But these days, I'm actually more likely to put on a, a Pertwee if I'm just wanting something a bit more random. So I, I was never a great appreciator of the Third Doctor era. And uh, I just when the DVDs had come out, I finally decided to watch it all in one big hit. And in, in seeing it all in context, I actually really fell in love with that. So I find it a lot easier and quite pleasant to, you know, delve back into the Pertwee era uh, at any point in time. So you're a classic era fan more than any yes. other. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I still enjoy the, the modern stuff and I'm, you know, I'm happy to watch that as well. But I guess if I'm, going back to watch anything again it's it's always classic era yeah and when you work for the magazines too you got the privilege of um getting a lot of the episodes before they were released weren't they you got to read them and see them beforehand because you had to know where things were going yeah with with titan we we had a little bit of that which was amazing like i remember reading the christmas special the 12th doctor one where you you had the first doctor appear and um being able to, to read that ahead of time was amazing. Yeah, that, that was one of the really exciting things. I mean, even down to the comics, we would get the scripts in ahead of time. And, and sometimes there was really exciting stuff happening there. So I'd, I'd stop reading the actual comics and just read the scripts as they came through the door because I, I wanted to see what happened. Okay. I don't know if you guys read uh, any of the, or many of the comics, but we did a really good... Uh, third Doctor series by Paul Cornell uh, with Christopher Jones on art and he did some really clever stuff there bringing in uh, the second Doctor as well that's all I'm going to say on on that because I don't want to spoil it but it was the best like we, we put out some great comics but for me that was the best mini series we did of all it was incredible and I'd, I'd read the first two in comic form and I'd got ahead and I was just like, right, I've got to read these scripts as they come in because it was so good. And Paul really brought them to life. So the scripts read incredibly. And then it was fun to see actually how uh, Chris translated that to, you know, the art and actually 
bringing that to the page. But yeah, we were able to read some of the actual uh, on-air stuff early as well, which was always really exciting. Yeah, great. So what's your history with uh, audio and Doctor Who? So we had a... Um, I, before moving to, to London, I lived in Brisbane for a, a period of time, and we had a crime bookshop there called Pulp Fiction, which is apparently still around uh, in a different place. And they were stocking the BBC books at the time. And this was sort of very early 2000s. And and I was like, I wanted to get back into Doctor Who and see what was out there again, other than the DVDs, which I'd been sort of getting and, and watching at that point. And so I found the BBC books, started buying those, had a, a subscription, and it turned out that they had big finish CDs there as well. And they were ridiculously expensive um, because they were imported and so niche. But I was paying $60 a disc uh, back in whatever it was, 2002 maybe. So it, it was an insane amount. And, but I, I bought a couple through them, really liked it. I was just... I remember the excitement of tapping the vein of Doctor Who again, and this was the closest thing you could have to seeing it or, or having it on screen. It was the actual people. It was, it was super exciting. And so I, I sort of investigated, discovered that you could subscribe directly. And again, insanely expensive. But when I figured it out based on the equation of $60 a disc, it was something like half price. So it was like, all right, this is not so bad actually. Uh, at the po- at that point I had a pretty good job. So I was like, all right, I'm going to subscribe. And interestingly, the first one that I got, so my subscription began with uh, number 50, Zagreus. And the one we're going to be doing today was the, the last one of that first year. Uh, not the end of my subscription because I renewed, so I, you know, I kept getting them for long after. But yeah, this was the the, the one we're going to talk about is the end of the first year of uh, my subscription. So I can't actually remember which were the ones I'd paid exorbitant amounts of money for <laughs> but the, the uh, bookshop. Incredibly enough, but I remember the the landmark of number fifty and the fact that Zagreus brought back you know, these doctors playing different characters and, and they were having a bit of fun with it. And that was when I sort of locked into Big Finish. And since then, I've pretty much stayed in there, you know, as, uh, yeah, I used to do a, well, no, I still do a lot of work with Big Finish just in terms of being another licensee. And I remember talking to Paddy, who used to do the marketing there. And I, I said, I think I know, you know, your range as well as, you know, my own. Because, yeah, I've, I've loved Big Finish stuff. Um, not just Doctor Who. I've sort of checked out The Prisoner, uh, the Blake Seven stuff, some of the Jerry Anderson. So, yeah, but what they do is amazing. Zagreus was an interesting one for you to start off on, on that subscription. Um, yeah. Because it, it kind of, it, it divides a lot of fans, that story. Some people loathe it. Some, some people love it, like I'm one of those. Uh, I guess there's people in between, but what was your opinion on that? Because it was it was supposed to be an anniversary story as well, 40th anniversary. Um, yeah. So so what were your initial thoughts after after hearing Zagreus for the first time? I think initially I was in that in between camp. That that was perfectly where I sat. So I could understand why people were upset or a bit miffed. Um, I could also get why people loved it. I think. The, the thing is, it kicked off that whole Divergence universe storyline, which I, I think was interesting. And so with the benefit of hindsight, you can say, well, actually, that opened up a really interesting chapter. But in, in terms of it, you know, I think it was fun for the creators to be like, OK, we're going to have Doctors, but just playing like different characters and regular people. They're not going to be the Doctors and so that was nice for them and it was an interesting concept but for a lot of fans it's more like i just want a multi-doctor story again because that's what anniversaries are about and we don't get enough of that so i enjoyed it and where it put us i mean i feel like it's one of those ones that you know a lot of people think is kind of best forgotten and i don't know how much it's really referenced in continuity even though uh, when they had the Night of the Doctor, I was, uh, you know, on TV and, and you saw 
uh, began regenerating. I was so excited where he's referencing Charlie and Kira's in that. And, you know, I think that was one of the most exciting moments of watching the new series for me was that just, uh, you know, made me whoop and cheer out loud that that validated all of that. But yeah, I, I, I think I was in the in-between camp. Now I appreciate it a lot more in hindsight for what it opened up, but I'm glad it didn't drag on too long. Yeah, I remember that's the grace, but as you said, we wouldn't have the Divergent Universe arc and we wouldn't have Gallifrey. So two mm-hmm. very important things came out of that one show. So yeah. what, what are we talking about tonight or today? What, and uh, why are we ch- talking about it? Why did you choose right. one, please? So, uh, anyone who's been doing sort of their math in their head already, if I started with number 50 and this was the end of my first year subscription, we are doing number 61, which is Faith Stealer. Doctor Who, Faith Stealer. Do your religions require ritual sacrifice, the drinking of blood or any special diet? No. Carter, come on. A joke's a joke. Where are you? Where am I? Uh, hello? What is it? Are any of you carrying gods about your person? Uh, no, I, I wonder, is all this uh, strictly de rigueur? I mean, couldn't we just pop inside and do the form filling some other time? Your faith and religious details must be recorded before you may enter the multi heaven. Please, Bishop Parash, you must not struggle. You're, you're in my mind. The less you fight it, the better it feels. What? What are you? I am Miraculite, and all shall live in me. Charlie and I are members of the tourist faith. We worship Keris here, and we begin each day with a ritual cup of tea. Your god's looking rather faint. Oh, God. Oh, Keris. What have they made you into? Kill me, please! All right. <gasps> Goodbye, my love. <gasps> this has to be. Uh, it's a story by Graham Duff, uh, which is within the. Is now is it Divergent or Divergence universe? I never remember. Divergent, I would say. Divergent, yeah. It's the divergent. And the, and the, the aliens divergent. within it, the aliens within there are uh, called the divergents. Are the divergents. There yeah. we go. Yes. Like, like uh, you know, you guys are in Australia and you're Australians. It's, yeah, of course. We're divergent, <laughs> obviously. <Divergence>. Yeah. <laughs> That's weird. So why, why out of all the uh, catalogue of Big Fish, where you were given the option to do whatever you wanted, you chose Space Dealer. How come? Well... Okay, so a couple of reasons. One, this one really stuck with me. I can remember playing this the first time. So obviously I was getting my, uh, you know, subscription on CD at that point. And it was in the great days of having, you know, a CD changer in the car where you could load up multiple discs. So I would always have a few Doctor Who stories in there, along with music, you know, and and variant. But I do remember driving to work and playing this. And, and I think I played it through like twice on repeat, basically. So just listen to it one after the other, that first occasion. And uh, it really stuck with me. Uh, it was it was fun to revisit because I haven't listened to it in, you know, a few years, obviously, because there's just such a wealth of other things to be listening to. And it, there's new releases all the time. But this one stuck with me because it's actually full of some really great lines. So there's really great segments of dialogue that are quite funny, great one-liners, and, and those had stuck with me. So I, I could remember specific little segments of this, even though I couldn't remember how the whole story played out. And uh, yeah, sure enough, in revisiting it, they were all there exactly as I remembered. So, you know, it may not be the very best one of all, but for me, it, it holds a... a a nice spot and I think there's some good things to talk about in it and it is just interesting and a little bit of a, a you know topical look at religion and and how that plays out in a society. Well, what's your impression of Faith Stilla? Um I loved loved it um, I love the play on uh, Faith Healer uh, in the title itself so that grabbed me straight away um, 
I, I'm a big one on sound design, so I, I really love the the whole sound design throughout. I think you've got Faith Stealer has a particular sound design. I can't remember off the top of my head um, whether they were using the the music and sound design in the in the previous season, but I do remember bits of music from Faith Stealer reappearing again in the finale, the next life of that uh, Divergent Universe arc. Um, so that was uh, that was pretty cool. Um, it deals a lot with um, with Keres as well and, and where he comes from because obviously he was a monk um, for, from the Church of the Fo- Foundation. That's right, yeah. And um, yeah, it's written by Graham Duff. So there's a lot of comedy in there because I don't know if you're if you've ever heard the radio series Nebulous uh, written by Graham Duff stars Mark Gatiss and he plays a character similar like a cross between the third doctor and Quatermass but a quirky it's a full-on hitchhikers uh, style well I can't really call it there's nothing quite like hitchhikers but it's a it's a science fiction comedy Um, unlike anything else that's out there it's not like red dwarfs not like hitchhikers it's its own thing Uh, so it's it's it has the comedic elements throughout faith stealer that um, that you'll get in nebulous and if you haven't heard it seek it out because it's really uh, really really cool to listen to mark gatiss is fantastic in it did graham duck do anything else for big finish not that i'm aware of i didn't do a search I actually went and looked this up beforehand just to try and do my due diligence. And uh, yeah, this this was actually the only thing he did for Big Finish, but it was also the only uh, Doctor Who fiction he did. But as uh, Dwayne was saying, you know, he's like an interesting character, actually. Uh, I, you know, I sort of looked into a bit more about him. So he's written for a lot of stuff. Uh, he did, uh, I think, some Alan Partridge stuff as well. So he did some work with Steve Coogan. And the other thing is that he was in the Twelfth uh, Doctor episode, Deep Breath. So he's he's actually done a bit of acting, and uh, he is he, the, he he's the robot waiter. Oh, okay, when they with uh, okay, yeah. So hmm. you know, not not a major thing, but at the same time, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, no, I remember him. So. Yeah, he, he seems to have been around, has done a lot for radio, a uh, little bit of acting. He was one of the uh, Dementors, I think it is, in the last two Harry Potter films. So I wonder yeah. if there was a lot of acting involved with that, but okay. <laughs> Apparently there's even some speaking part, which maybe is a little bit like, <sighs> but still, <laughs> it's vocalising. So right. yeah, he, he's had an interesting career, but in terms of both Doctor Who and Big Finish, this is his only contribution, which is a little bit sad because I, I think, you know, it's great. And he's certainly got the, the handle on dialogue and, yeah, what he writes yeah. works very well for audio, which I guess makes sense that he's done so much radio. Yeah, he certainly know. I think he knows the Doctor damn really well and, and all the companions. So, yeah. So it was written, so I should say, should, yeah, a few facts. So it was recorded in June of 2004 and released in October. Um, which was actually about six months before it was supposed to be released. So do people know the background of why this got rushed back so quickly? Were they trying to wrap up the Divergent Universe really quickly? Is that part of it? Or... Yeah, yeah, because the uh, show was coming back to TV in 2005. So when, when the Divergent Universe started, the plan was to do four, se- four series in the Divergent Universe. And so Gary had this big plan and map, and the third series was already mapped out. In fact, I think three of the stories written would end up being uh, reworked slightly after they came back to the Divergent Universe. Um, so yeah, Graham's, oh, sorry, Gary's big plan uh, was for four seasons, but once they found out the show was coming back, um, Big Fish just didn't know what the reaction would be and whether they'd have a whole huge number of people start to come and join them. And he just felt that if it was all set in a, in a different universe, it wouldn't make sense for anyone. So they decided they had to wrap it up really fast. So rather than having 16 episodes there, they went to eight and they were brought forward by six months. So it was all finished before the new series started. I see. And uh, a lot of people had issues with that particular arc. Um, I don't know why. The only only thing that I have trouble with is that concept that they threw in there of of the universe having no time. 
Um, so that's a really hard one to wrap your head around because um, uh, as human beings we are surrounded by time ourselves so that's it's interesting the way they try and deal with that but I think even uh, they found it a bit hard to try and deal with uh, in, a, in a story setting um, the other thing too was it was interesting that most of the most of the characters in them seem to have looked human because there was a there was a throwaway a line in there with uh, about Kerry's so oh, isn't he a strange looking fellow um, whereas I was under the impression that the divergent universe was where Rassilon had exiled um, all these uh, aliens who were evolving in the wrong way so they weren't like time lords so he wanted to lock them away so if that's the case to my mind then all the aliens should uh, look like carriers or even stranger we had the Croman. uh yeah sorry philip go on i was just gonna say, i think my understanding is that the so in terms of the grace the the, the audio there russell on was creating lots of mini universes where he was sticking all the creatures but they weren't all in the same one so i think the divergent universe is a particular one where he placed the divergence because as, as, as i understand it as i was trying to work it all out from listening to the grace and a few other bits trying to do my due diligence uh the chris uh so the divergence were seen to be going to rival the time lords and so wrestling stuck them in a pocket universe the divergent universe but then he stuck other creatures in other universes so they weren't all in that one pocket universe that was just a particular one which he was yeah you know, just to deal with them and, and actually some research in terms of the, the time thing was Rasslon set it up so that every couple of thousand years, everything we set back to zero. And so, t- so time kept going f- forward and then back to zero and then forward and back to zero. And so it just kept replaying itself over and over. And that's why the concept of time was lost, supposedly, because they had to reset themselves so many times. The people in the universe just kept resetting, resetting, resetting. And the events kept occurring over and over again the same way and resetting which is why there's no time travel, TARDIS travel in the universe, because it's just time looped all the time. So you couldn't actually go forward or back in a time set because it kept being over-looped, over-looped, over-looped. It's a bit of a bizarre concept. I must admit, maybe it was a bit too clever. And <laughs> I, I didn't really- Can, can you start again from what I think is? No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty I, I, complicated. I, I, it's a great, it's a great concept, but it's just, uh, it's a little bit complicated. At it was, I think, it was a bit too convoluted. <laughs> As yeah. I had to read a couple of articles to try and understand what was going on, because certainly, as I listen to the stories, I have no idea. And even the passing through the zones, there's some sort of zone. Oh, zones. the interzone. The interzone, yeah. Interzones. I didn't even understand that. And of course, when I you know, listened to this a couple of days ago. It all starts in the interzone. Uh, yeah. um, and I was trying to remember, hang on, what on earth are the interzones? It looks like there's one planet that's been set up, which has yes. bits of all the other planets as models of, for evolution. Is that about the idea? I thought it was just to act as a gateway planet. And, and so essentially there was an entrance to each of the other planets from this particular oh, planet. So- so- it, it okay. was the, the nexus where you would come back to if you needed to get to somewhere else because otherwise there was no travel within sort of the, the divergent universe. Okay, so you had to use this okay, system travel. Yeah. Okay. So you had to come back to the interzone as being the, not waiting room, but yeah, it was the central point. Yeah. I, I think part of the reason why people struggle with the whole um, arc is it's, <laughs> there's a lot in there to try and understand and you really need to have all the stories together to piece together what's going on. Yeah. I think it's a bit hard to dip into one story. Um, anyhow, basically, what's, what, what are some of the things, Chris, that appeal to you in terms of storyline that stand out? Um, I, I mean, I guess I, you know, religion's always fascinating and particularly, you know, exploring different ones where they're all mashing up against one another in the one place and the fact of the level of tolerance here but also the intolerance that naturally comes out of that so you know it's presented as oh we're very tolerant you know all religions coexist here it's fine and then of course there always is that one that wants to try and dominate them all and and uh you know push through and so in this case it's the lucidians that are you know doing something here to really uh mess with the balance as such so i i enjoyed that 
kind of a, a approach to begin with. As I said, there's just some great sort of scenes and one-liners and things here. So the, the first one I remembered really well and that stands out, and I'm sure you guys, you know, will, will know which one I mean, but it's where uh, they need to identify themselves when first arriving uh, here. And, and so they're asked what religion they're from. And, you know, when pressed, the, the eighth doctor, after being asked multiple times, is like, uh, we're tourists. And uh, is the, the guy writing the notes is like, oh, so you're from the tourist faith. Uh, what does that entail? And he said, uh, well, we worship our friend Kira's here. Uh, and every morning we have a ritual cup of tea. And so, you know, it's full of great stuff like that. that that's, you know, just one of the examples. But I do remember that tourist faith coming up as a thing. And actually it is referenced, I think, in one of the later uh, sort of episodes as such in the uh, divergence saga where uh yeah the doctor is reminding charlie that they are of the tourist faith didn't one of the administrators who all seem to have welsh accents um yeah. get a bit annoyed with them at one point so bloody tourists that's uh, yes. i'm sure he said that at yeah. one point he <laughs> does yeah yep. no, there, there is yeah and and yeah. in fact there's there is a part where they're talking about how there's all these other religions constantly springing up and how they just take a hold really quickly. And it's as they're walking through, you can hear someone preaching about joining the tourists in the background of a scene where uh, the doctor and Charlie are talking, I think with the board and Anne. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it's already taken off and no one knows what it is. It's literally on this information that they worship curious and drink a cup of tea. It's, it's established. It was the Church of the Serendipity that amused me the most. Oh, they worship, me too. Worshipping me too. accidents. Oh, whoops, be praised. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, every time something, yeah, bad fortune to you and, yeah, just, yeah, that, that was the one that amused me most. Ah, uh, you beat me to it, Philip. That was the one I was going to point out. Love that one. <laughs> so yeah. Dwayne. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's my second one, because, yeah, there's like, they're, they're fantastic. The, the whole concept of them and, and the idea of everything's happy accidents and, you know, oh, I, I hope that there are many ills that, you know, befall your path and all this sort of thing. It's, yeah, they, they were hilarious. And actually, so it, I was just going to say, it's, it's them that leads up to the one other line that I remembered the most. Um, there's a point later on where all the uh, other religions are trying to flee the city uh, as the Lucidians are taking over. And this, uh, I think it's Charlie is saying, we need a bit of a change here. We need something. And the guy from the Church of Serendipity says, Renaissance is futile. <laughs> and I was just like, this is great. You know, to me, that's sort of, uh, you know, almost, uh, what would you say, uh, cross license pollination there, you know. Yeah. Potential Star Trek reference. <laughs> So Paul McCann as a doctor, how do you goes? Oh, I think I think it's a really good one for him, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at the point where I'd started listening to these, I'd been reading the BBC books for a while, got a lot more of a feel for him. Um, but I think this is one of the ones where you get a little bit more of his humour. I, I think you know, it's it's quite dry and and subtle, but you get a bit more humour out of him, I feel, than, than you do in other ones. He can be a little bit too serious and po-faced, but I, I think partly how he's written in the scenario he finds himself in, it's a, it's a lot funnier. And so he matches the, the tone around him. Uh, I really like it, um, but I'm also a, a big fan of this uh, particular group of companions. So Charlie and Kira are my favorite of the sort of newly created uh, audio companions. Okay, so I mean, Charlie, I adore, and yeah, actually, you've been India. I vaguely remember you being with India too. You've been India Fisher, sure, yeah, I think. yes. Um, uh, in India, I know India spent the entire time at the convention in Australia telling some show Conrad has apps. So I think Conrad had paid her to tell her to get get him to come. Um, <laughs> um, what, what, why careers? What is it about careers that you like? Well, I, I guess it was the fact that he was an alien companion for a start. I know that in the comic strips they've done that before with giving the, the Doctor an, an alien companion. And I guess, you know, 
several of them have been alien as such. They just happen to be aliens from planets where they just look exactly like humans. But the beauty of the audio and the way it's described and various things, you do get the fact that Kira's is quite different. And I like the fact that he's this monk, as, as you find out here, I think this is the first time he mentions being a monk from um, the, the foundation religion. So that was kind of unique there. Uh, and then, um, yeah, it, it was just the fact that audio, it, it gave you the potential that he could look like anything and actually be alien. So I, I was able to, to picture this and, and to imagine a scenario where the doctor had companions that looked different. I think that, that was the biggest thing. Doesn't he blend into a chair at some point uh, during this episode? Yeah. Get his chameleon yeah, abilities come out? Yeah. Yeah, he, he keeps blending into his background a lot. But yeah, there's one point where he almost fades completely into a chair when he's being questioned. He's a very tragic figure right from the outset. Like, Creed of the Cromen was was pretty full on and it kind of never stopped for Paul Keres, did it? Yeah. No, well, that's the thing. His, his arc is quite tragic and he's, you know, spoiler alert, he is one of the companions that doesn't meet the best of ends. Um, uh, yeah, no, he's, he's tragic and he's carrying the weight of this guilt of, uh, you know, killing his lover, which is, is all through this episode quite heavily. I, I think it's heavily explored and it's what makes him susceptible and open to, you know, essentially being, uh, corrupted by the Lucidians. So again, another spoiler, I guess, hopefully when people are listening to these episodes, they've maybe gone and listen to the the one we're talking about first so it's not a spoiler it's more like yeah yeah i agree with that or that guy's an idiot but um yeah you there's a there's a lot that plays off uh, kira's past uh in this particular one both opening it up and then using it as actually driving his story along i think the one that was curious has with any alien creature they have was when they came back to earth once they left the diversion universe yes it was very hard to know what do they do with him. And I think that was the struggle with all the stories once back on Earth. Um, because he was going to be too alien to actually do Earth and do history. Although although <laughs> Other Lives is fantastic. I can't say I remember that. It's, what happens to Other Lives? Is that, is that the one set in the... Um, other Lives, uh, is a, it's got uh, the Eighth Doctor on the cover. He's got a beard. And uh, he's, got a, he's got a woman there insisting that uh, he is her husband all the way through it. Keras gets, uh, I think he gets captured by a, uh, uh, like uh, what, show you, what do you, yeah, some kind of showman who, uh, who, who puts him in a freak show. Yeah. So that was, that was handled quite well. Can I tell you a personal story about Faith Stealer for me? Not, not long after I heard Faith Stealer, almost at the same time, uh, a very freaky thing happened to me where I was uh, I was working with someone and our job was to demolish the inside of a house. So we were pulling out walls, we were throwing out cupboards, uh, you know, tall boys, things like that. And I opened up this one chest of drawers and in the top of the chest of drawers was this old makeup container. It would have it would have been something from the you know 40s, 50s. And on the the top of it, it was called lucidity so and i and i kept it as uh, like a little memento it was very strange that i just listened to faith stealer and found that thing at the same time so there is makeup out there once upon a time called lucidity there you go it means glow doesn't it isn't something something's lucid it's bright and glowing is that lucid i i thought lucid is sort of um Clear, not as <laughs> see through, but uh, you know, you, oh, yeah, yeah, lucidity, lucidity. I looked it up. Lucidity clarity. has two. It has two meanings. One of them is clarity, yeah. and the other one is super bright. So, oh. yeah, <laughs> there you go. You're both That's right. Fine. You're both right. Yeah, <laughs> actually, it works really well. That as, a, as in terms of the story, doesn't it? Because it's both yeah. things. It's blindingly bright, and it also brings clar well, theoretically, clarity. So that it actually does both things in the story. Hmm. Well, there you yeah. go. Graham Duff, you know, super smart. And yeah, it's like, what a shame we didn't get some more Doctor Who audios out of him. That's for sure. Now, it's also the first appearance of a um, 
little unknown actor in this production. Does anyone know who the first production is? No. In the cast? John Dorney. Oh, of course. Uh, yep. So it's actually the first time John Dorney appears anything, and of course he's going to end up becoming major actor, major writer for the show. So this is the first time he um, is in, in any big finished production. Who was he in this one? Uh, he's listed as... Bacoan. Oh right, the yeah. So it's obviously when they take Kira's into the first temple where he's going to be healed, and there's the hymn that is in praise of itself that just keeps going. He's the, the guy they speak to. Yeah. So it's okay. Bacoan, that makes yeah. Sense. So it's, it's it's a very large cast actually. When you think a lot of them aren't a lot of double ups or things. I think I understand actually. It was oh, no, I'm not sure. No, no idea why. Big cast must be a bit expensive to do, but yeah, great. Yeah, and and some really good turns in there. Like the the guy who's playing Lan Carter, who is the the head of the Church of Lucidity. I don't remember his name, but he was like quite you know an older established actor, and you can see he he lends a lot of gravitas to that role because he has to be coming across as this charismatic cult leader that. Is pushing things through, and and I think he's incredible. And then the the lady who plays the the border man uh, is is also great. Like there's some good, I don't know, sort of hefty voice acting here, actually. Yeah, it's it's and well cast kind of to it, which I I really I appreciate that. But yeah, it's it's a good and big cast. I should okay. point out that uh, I noticed Gary Russell popping up in there. He was one of the members of the Church of Serendipity. Um, so often, uh, I miss those days. Well, you, you, you get the directors popping up. You hear Nick Briggs all the time these days. But back then, Gary Russell would often pop up and you'd, he'd got a very distinctive voice as well. Yeah, I think Gary's always, he does little um, bits and everything, computer voices or doors speaking or just little yeah. parts that they don't pay back to for, just <laughs> any hops. Any, any final comments you want to make about it? Um... Nothing that I can think of, but yeah, as you referenced, I think, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd said that Charlie and Kiris were probably my favourite teams, and yeah, I, I thought Charlie was fantastic, and yeah, I, I did get to meet uh, India Fisher a couple of times, which was really cool, and I remember when I moved to the UK, um, she was at one of the first Dimensions cons I went to, which were ones that used to happen up in Newcastle, so I think it was either 2008 or 2009, as she was there and there was all these great people that I got to meet for the first time so Louise Jameson who you guys just had on was there uh, Annika Wills was there Sarah Sutton all these really cool people uh, but I was almost most excited to meet India Fisher because uh, I you know I, I so loved uh, Charlie on the audios so yeah it's nice to revisit this era and yeah, I, I think Faith Stealer is a good one from this time that you could delve into. It gives you lots of questions in that you're like, what the hell is this interzone, this divergent universe? Who is Kira's? What is going on here? But the story stands up well enough on its own that you can appreciate it for what it is as just a, a good Doctor Who adventure that, you know, happens to be in the middle of some overarching uh, story that is, is much bigger. Yeah, it certainly wants you, makes you want to listen to more. And yeah. It was probably actually a good thing to that they had brought it forward, because in, you know the first four that I've written series, you know, two of them were quite out there. The show, so which yeah. is the two hand, is you know a brilliant, brilliant show, but it's out there in terms of strange. And then there's the other one, the spinning natural top history of fear, natural history of fear, which I love as well. But my favourite. <laughs> oh, is it? There you go. Yeah, with another very strange one, which we'll talk sometime about, Dwayne. <laughs> Um, so it was actually nice to get a bit of a run of a bit more normal stories to actually ground Curry's and ground the characters. And Faith Stealer yeah. was uh, a, a good length as well. We were, the, the next story that we're about to go into after this was the last. And uh, great story, but man, the episode's length were about 37 minutes per episode in the last. Do you remember that? How long it actually went for? Yes. It was uh, it was a bit torturous to get through, but it was still a good story. But anyway, I'm just commenting. Say, yeah, 
<laughs> my memory of that is that it dragged, even though it was a really good story, which mm. I guess fits with, um, you know, some of the old shows where, you know, you suddenly get a, a six-parter and you're like, oh, that's a bit long in the tooth. Like they've, <laughs> they've kind of over egg the pudding on this one. And, and that was what the last felt like. It was like, this is a really good story. It just should have been shorter. Don't tell Phil he doesn't even like four-parters anymore. <laughs> I've decided the 55 minute hour episode is the perfect audio format I've become, become the old I am obviously short attention span can't, can't remember anything earlier oh, yeah no I, I, I still like the shorter episodes and more of them but yeah four is good all right, so now we're into the segment of our show where we recommend something for you, or something else, our dear listener, to uh, to have a listen to. It doesn't have to be Doctor Who related. And uh, might go to you first. Chris, have you got anything you want to recommend to our listeners? Yeah. So this is sort of something else on audio that isn't necessarily, you know, Doctor Who. Could be Could anything. Be, but yeah, anything at all. So a couple of things. Um... I've recently been tapping back into all things, well, all the things that I love. I guess being, you know, essentially locked down and, and feeling that in some ways I still am or should be, uh, you know, I'm looking for things to entertain me at home and, and also just to go back to the comfort food and the things I love. So I've been listening back to the two, well, there's three of them. I haven't got the third yet, but they're the first two uh, prisoner box sets from Big Finish. And I don't know if you have had a chance to listen to those, but Nick Briggs was obviously, and, and is obviously a huge Prisoner fan. I know for some people, they're not 100% sold on, on what he's done there. But for me, I think they really hold up well. Like Mark Elstob, who plays number six in it, does an incredible job. They're, they're great to delve into. The best thing he does with them is that some of it is is reimaginings of you know classic episodes from that that one season of the prisoner that we've got but essentially they've taken the title and maybe a rough concept and and built out from there but there's a lot of stuff that's done on the audio of these where you could only do it as an audio adventure so i know there's one where basically you know the prisoner is blind and being directed around and so it works so well on audio. It's, it's kind of playing to the strength of the format there. And I really enjoyed that. The other thing I've tapped back into is uh, one of the spin-off audios, which is the Caldor City ones, which are, you know, based on the sort of Robots of Death uh, storyline and, and world. And yeah, I, I was quite a fan of those at the time uh, and really enjoyed them. So I've, I've yeah. I've tapped back into those. And in fact, I haven't listened to it. So maybe, you know, you guys can tell me how they are, but I want to then pick up the new robot series that Big Finish is doing, because I think that's just such a, a rich, you know, uh, vein to be mining of, you know, the, the robots there and that whole world. So yeah, I'm looking forward to checking them out. But for people who miss Calgary City, it's still available out there and, uh, I think it was Alan Stevens who was the producer on that. He does, he's the editor, I think, on Celestial Toy Room or Toy Box, but the uh, Doctor Who Appreciation Society magazine. And he's still selling the Cowboy City audios. I don't know if that's just on the quiet, but, you know, you can find out how to get them still from him because I'm... Dwayne actually, uh, actually did a podcast on them early on when he first started the podcast off. And actually, I enjoyed it so much, I went and re-listened to the whole series and... Boy, it's a great series. And then did you did two. you did you get the short uh, the short um, trip virtually that you can download to download only? Uh, it's got it's got Castoniago being interrogated by by yes. somebody, and right at the end uh, he blurts out who he who he really is. Because all the way through, we're, we're we're thinking to ourselves, this is Avon from Blake Seven, right? Um, and um, yeah, that that short story. Uh, virtually answers the question in a in a way that you won't quite expect. <laughs> it's very metafictional. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah bit, 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 bit metafictional. It's, it's a great two hand to see in that one. But yeah, so it's great, great, great choices, Chris. And what about you, Philip? What have you got for us? Well, 
I'm trying to catch up and keep up with all we're trying to listen to at the moment. But one <laughs> of the things I've just listened to that's come out is the Six Doctor and Perry box set. So I was curious to get into this just because this is the way Big Finish is going. Because the, the monthly range will be ending very soon, which I think is actually a good thing, but I'm still a bit sad about it. It's sort of the old tradition to me. Um, but I can't cope with it think, ending on 275. It's, it should be 300. <laughs> <laughs> it could be it could it could be two seventy three. That'd be really bad. Oh, that'd be the worst. <laughs> <laughs> they obviously still chose the number, but yeah, the box set is. If, if this is the way that they're going to be heading, which it looks like they are in terms of the box set with Doctor Companion, this is a good way to kick things off. So good series, of, good series of stories. I actually enjoy all of them. Um, a range of emotions. I won't talk too much about it yet. We'll maybe do some more later. But if you haven't got it yet, it's certainly worth getting. It's a it's a great release this month. What about you, Drain? What are you going to recommend? Since I mentioned it before, I'm going to recommend. Um, I'm not sure where you would get it from, but um, I'm going to recommend Nebulous uh, by Graham Duff. So uh, if you if you like your science fiction comedy, definitely get yourself a copy. I think there's two series, six episodes per series. I've got a I've got a feeling. David Warner might be in it as the as the the bad guy, the master style character, I think, but I could be wrong. Um, but that's it's been ages since I've heard it, and, and Graham Duff's name just uh, made me remember how much I enjoyed it. And uh, I've got them, I've got them all back home in Tassie. I haven't got them with me uh, up here, so um, be a while before I'll be able to get to hear them again. But uh, Nebulous by Graham Duff, check that out. So. One other thing, I'm going to grab a prop quickly while you're finishing there, because I just remembered something else I picked up recently. Sorry, only because you were talking about <laughs> stuff to recommend. Uh, I ugh, Is this showing up? Sort of. If I hold it at that angle, it is. Uh, yeah, so I just picked up this. It's We apologise for the inconvenience. It is a audio play by, what is his name? Goodness me. Okay, so Owen Cook. No, it's, it's, come on, it's Mark, somebody, Mark Griffiths. There we go. And um, the people from Cutaway Comics or Cutaway Universe who are doing the Litton comic that was kickstarted. I don't know if you saw that, but this is something that they're selling on their website. It literally just arrived the other day, so I haven't had a chance to listen, but it's a audio play about Douglas Adams and... So I've got the vinyl version and I will be playing that as soon as I finally get a chance to relax and listen to something new again, which will probably be at some point this week. But uh, yeah, that's quite cool. And uh, if I can say one other plug, for those of you who like Big Finish, I sort of didn't mention this before, but uh, at Eagle Moss Hero Collector, we've produced a couple of Big Finish box sets of figurines. So we have uh, one of the Eighth Doctor in his sort of TV movie look uh, with Lucy Miller and a Dalek. And then we have another one in his sort of more modern uh, leather jacketed look with Livchenko and a Dalek. Um, and I think the Lucy Miller one is getting increasingly hard to get. So I apologize if you're only hearing about it now, but the Livchenko one should still be available at least in small quantities. Do you know where? Uh, I, I, I thought there was. I thought I saw that was sold out on the website, on the Big Finch website. Are they available outside of the Big Finch website? I, so we actually sell directly, and I think yeah, we even have a, an e-commerce store in Australia. So depending on whether you're here in the UK, in Australia, in the US, these are uh, available there. But I, I have a feeling it's quite possible the Lucy Miller one is sold out everywhere now. Now, whether we make another run of them at some point remains to be seen. But uh, I think at this point, it's a little bit of a collector's piece. The Libchenko one, you should still be able to get, I think, from us or Big Finish. Um, yeah, they look great. Yeah. No, they, they do. They're, they're really nice. And it's kind of nice to have both versions of the Eighth Doctor. I, I really hope we do some more uh, Big Finish characters and things. You know, ideally, I'd love, you know, Eighth Charlie and Kira's for obvious reasons, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I'll get my wish. 
No, very good. Well, it's been uh, it's been fantastic having you on, Chris. Thanks for coming on to chat with us about uh, some audio and what you do. It's uh, it's fascinating to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun to, to you know mostly not be talking about work and just talk about the audios again. It's, I love it. And uh, thank you, Philip, for being Chris's cousin and getting Chris on. <laughs> My pleasure. He's, yeah, <laughs> he's so lucky to have me as a cousin. That's all I can say. <laughs> All right, until next time on the Sirens of Audio, it's uh, been great to have you with us and we'll catch you next time. Bye for now. Bye-bye.